Hello and welcome back to a, another happy hour and welcome to my dungeon. This is probably the first time that we stream from here. Uh, I moved, visited Florida. It's been a crazy four weeks. We've been working a lot as well. So we haven't had a live one of these in a while, but we're back. I am co-creative director here at backflip thanks so much for jumping in and joining as always we've got john shoemaker what's up john hello and welcome to my dog. perfect i heard you almost like you have that mat across your microphone it's possible <laughs> <laughs> that's i like to, your... I, I like to soften <laughs> soften my audio it's funny because it, it almost sounds like extra noise reduction like it just kind of peeks out but i missed your joke what was your joke i said welcome to my dungeon welcome yeah you got the red lights there that's not creepy at all what's that behind you this that looks extra right creepy <laughs> i i don't know he just showed up <laughs> what do you mean i don't see anything behind me <laughs> that's uh that's me as a puppet so yeah got new wardrobe too did you light it red because the puppets there or <laughs> was it red and then you put the puppet in there yeah, i didn't light it red <laughs> <laughs> um what was i gonna say oh well, let me know if you hear i've got a uh a, a dryer down here it's like whoop, 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 whoop. i don't know if that picks up on the mic but let me know if you get noise from me you never hear it cool i'll just go nuts because of all the noises so before we bring our guests on, which I'm super excited about because we haven't talked to them yet and we got to watch their short film and we just haven't caught up with these guys in a little while. Um, and so I'm super excited to talk. And when we jump on beforehand, we don't talk. It's like awkward. I'm like, let's just check audio and then save the conversation because it's going to be so good. So first, we're going to we're going to talk about our drinks. What, what, do you, what did you bring today, John? I brought <laughs> the Bell's Christmas Ale, Christmas Scotch Ooh. Ale. Um, I cheated or I got to cheat because backstory is that somebody in this conversation showed up to backflip with huge amounts of beer of many different varieties. Uh, that would be Ryan. And Oh, you're talking about me. I, you know what? I'm not going to say why. Anyway, uh, he did that and we were, we were tasting them and this one was a really good one. There was another Christmas one that had like Christmas spices and other people said that they liked it. But to me, I was just like, well, it reminds me of Christmas <laughs> spices, but it's like the spices that you're not supposed to eat. Yeah. It's like you ate the potpourri on accident. Yeah. But this yeah. one, this one was good. The Scotch Ale was very smooth. Yeah. Good. That's a, that was a very smooth one. It also makes me want like a stronger Scotch Ale or just Scotch. So it's like a yeah. gateway drug for me. All right, I got some Terramana tequila today. Um, I was in Florida last week and we were drinking rum and I just really wanted tequila. Now, so. who makes that again? Uh, ter the Terramana Company. Oh. I, I don't know if you're familiar with them. Um, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, there's a, there's a poster over here you can't see. Uh, <laughs> my boy. Yeah, you yeah. Have, I will not be <laughs> satisfied until you actually have like a an old like wrestling picture of him up somewhere. I did wear a fanny pack at Flor in Florida, and I, I felt like the rock because I had a fanny pack. <laughs> it was amazing. All right. That's enough jabber. We got some viewers. We should definitely bring on our guests, except I like I changed my screen size, so it disappeared. There we go. We got Nate. We got Matt. What's up, guys? How's it going? Stream. Thanks for hanging in there. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Good to have us. Let's, uh, let's start. It, it is good to have you. Uh, let's have you guys talk a little bit about your drink, and then then we'll get all to the nitty gritty stuff of why we're here and what we're talking about. But we got to start with our happy hour stuff. Go for it, man. Uh, well, the dude does abide today, so rocking a little semi vegan because I didn't have any uh, any half and half uh, a little little white Russian here, so. Nice. Uh, only the most premium ingredients that were available at the time. <laughs> I, I like that you're like, are you vegan? Uh, no, I just couldn't get milk. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. 
That's it's awesome. semi-vegan. I was like, there's not enough. There was too much coconut milk. And so I was like, I got to have a little <laughs> bit of dairy milk. So ah, uh, nice. It out. Yeah. We always, we always encourage, we never pressure. So I appreciate you sharing a drink with us today. All right. What do we got, Nate? Well, I realized that I made an enormous mistake. I went down to my, uh, my drinks cooler in the basement and realized I was out of just about everything. So I grabbed what I thought was a propel to give me some, uh, some sweet fruity energy and ended up grabbing a sparkling Poland Springs, triple berry sparkling Ooh. water. And, um, I'm not a sparkling water fan. Not what you're expecting. <laughs> so ice That's... cold Arctic water might be my, my drink of choice this morning afternoon it's an acquired taste that still sounds <laughs> better than that uh caramel apple mountain dew you had yeah yeah i passed on that this morning Ooh. which it's not good for a wisconsin filmmaker not to like sparkling water because Lacroix is literally on every set in the world so <laughs> yeah and we're cheap and we have clarb i mean you, you can get clarb clarb run and it's local uh from costco it's like yeah. Four four dollars for a thirty pack, or I, maybe they give you four dollars if you buy a thirty pack. I don't know. It doesn't Quality make any stuff. sense. Yeah. So thanks for coming on today, and I think I I titled it documentary filmmaking. Um, we met you guys probably at a Wave Awards uh, with Madison Media Professionals back in the day when you guys had some work, and we're like, who are these young guys doing good stuff? Um, which was really, really awesome to see. And, you know, some faith-based stuff, which is cool too, which resonates with us. But why don't you guys give us a little bit of your backstory before I, I tell your backstory? Sure. Go ahead, start? man. We'll both defer. No, yeah, sure. Um, so Nate and I, uh, I, I probably have been doing filmmaking stuff about as long as I've known Nate. Um, he was kind of into it before I was. And then we got, uh, we met in, we were seniors in high school, um, went to the same school for our, our senior year. And uh, we uh, became friends and realized that uh, I was interested in writing. Nate had been uh, making films for a while at that point. And so uh, we, I think we went, cobbled together some like props and some some like army uniforms and tried to make a little world war ii movie um and uh terror like you know pretty terrible script never got finished mm -hmm. but that's kind of uh the bug how, how i caught the bug work and it was working with nate which was pretty cool too so and uh yeah did some stuff in college together um and then we've been yeah we've really literally been working together since that point so Nice. And your your uh, bio says brothers in law as well. <laughs> so it's not it's not Nate's family that's over at your house, is it? <laughs> no, it's not. Yeah. Yeah, Nate uh, Nate became I always joke that uh, he became friends with me so he could uh, date my sister, but <laughs> oh <laughs> so Nate doesn't make in law jokes. Or he's not allowed to participate in making in-law jokes like, oh, the in-laws are over. You're like, hey, yeah, that's me. Got to be a little careful, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, that's a sketch that you guys may take and, and run with. That would be awesome. <laughs> the ideas are flowing. Yeah. So what, I mean, you guys kind of connected, you said, in it was at high school? Yep. Um, but but I don't know, Matt, before that, what what kind of got you you into it? What What were your interests? Yeah, so I've always like since I was a kid, like probably since I was like five or six years old, I've always I've enjoyed like writing and telling stories. So I would like write these little. I don't know if y'all remember Microsoft Publisher. Anyone remember mm -hmm. Microsoft Publisher? But they had a template for like uh, a book, and so like I kind of made my own artwork, and then I'd like uh, come up with these stories and print out little booklets for myself. And so like it kind of was like writing and oh, story that's fun. stories. Yeah, yeah that uh, kind of came out of like, you know, normal like kid, like make believe stuff with, with my siblings. Um, and then started, honestly, like a big thing was like watching the Lord of the Rings and then watching the supplemental material. Like mm. I remember, mm -hmm. I kind of like always used to watch the DVDs when I was a kid, like the supplements and then 
bought the Lord of the Rings extended editions and watching that, it was like, oh, this is like something you can do. And these are the mechanics of it. And then you're like, I want to do that. That looks amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so like, that's kind of what made me fall in love with it was like watching those filmmaking specifically and like interested mm -hmm. in watching those, uh, those, those DVD extras. Um, but specifically the Lord of the Rings ones, cause it like laid out the entire process of like, this is cool. So. Yeah, that's funny that you say that because that that's something too that resonates with me. And it's um, what was it like? Maybe Rush Hour, uh, just a hilarious movie, <laughs> and watch the outtakes behind it, and then kind of started getting into the filmmaking. And then it was like after that that like I started buying like Lord of the Rings, and then you get the director's commentary, you get the behind the scenes, mm -hmm. you get all that stuff, and I just love that, you know. And it it kind of I don't know maybe want to be like oh i could do that that looks like a ton of fun um and i would also do the stories as well but i would make stories for uh like D, &D games that i would never play oh, cool. i played like D, D like twice but i would always make stories and characters and things like that and put them in a book and like hey here's my adventure and then i guess they just get thrown away <laughs> um so that's that's cool yeah and, and so now you guys and we'll get we'll get to you in a second nate uh now you guys are doing just awesome award-winning stuff and getting paid for it, right? Yeah, no, it's it's been uh, it's count myself very you know fortunate and and uh, lucky to be able to do this kind of work. So yeah, it's been uh, yeah very grateful for sure. Nice, cool. Before we get to the film that we John and I both just watched and very much enjoyed, Nate, you're up. What's your origin story? Well, <clears throat> probably uh, a little more nerdy than, than Matt's. Um, I think my uh, uh, my origin story starts when I was a little kid. I have a lot of brothers and sisters, and we'd all play together. And the big thing was, um, was G.I. Joe's. And we have all of our G.I. Joe's, and we literally write a script for our G.I. Joe's, and we... <laughs> We would we would act out the script as if the GI Joes were actors, and we'd direct to them and, and and stuff like that, which was pretty nerdy. Um, then in high school, we got our hands on a, a camcorder, a little little Sony Handycam, and we'd just do a bunch of stunts. I was into skateboarding and and flips and random parkour stuff, whatever was was cool back in the early two thousands, and uh, would would actually do some editing on a VCR. And uh, put a VHS tape in the VCR, connect the camera, and like hit record on the camera as, as you hit play, and and do my little editing in in camera like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then, like as Matt said, uh, he and I connected in high school and kind of bounced off each other and um, kind of experimented with some more um, cinematic uh, stuff, if you will. And then throughout college, so. Yeah, and how did how did you guys kind of get into like the faith stuff? Was that always a part of your upbringing? Is that new? Um, is that kind of how you started making stuff together? Or? Yeah, I think it's it's kind of always been on the back burner of what we wanted to do. Um, obviously, there was a long period of time where we didn't understand that this is something that you could do unless you're in Hollywood as a career. Um, I didn't find that out until probably junior senior year of college. And so for us, we were just kind of goofing around, I think, and, and we enjoyed it. So we were just kind of exploring that and, and taking the next step and the next step and the next step just because it was it was cool. And we felt like, you know, we could get better at it. And then I think once he and I both kind of found out we could do this as a living, that's when um, for me, the way it started was I, I grew up in a Christian home and um, the media I was allowed to consume was very limited mm. and it's limited to like Christian made films and stuff. So I understood and realized how horrible the um, production value was for that. I think so my, my, my initial uh, yeah, amen passion. <laughs> yeah. 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 So my initial passion to do uh, faith-based work is because there's just, a, just such a, a small pool of, of watchable content. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. wanted to change that. I wanted to bring, uh, I wanted like you watch something that either has good acting, which was rare, or production value, 
good cinematography or, you know, it, it have one element. And yeah, something's got to be good. It can't all be bad and then have a good message because no one's going to want to receive that or <laughs> be entertained by it. Right, right. And it just seems so rare that or or just never that you'd, you'd get all of those in one film. And so it's just always been my goal. I wanted to make stuff uh, that, that that is faith based, but is watchable and, and draws in every viewer, not just a very select niche of mm -hmm. uh, um, people. So that's kind of where my passion kind of originated. Yeah, that, that's awesome. That's something John and I, you know, from the beginning strive to as well, because like, you know, even the Christian media versus Catholic media, Catholic media was like the worst of the worst, like so bad. And so, I mean, there's some good opportunity there, but just the same thing, like, hey, we want to put out good stuff with good message that also doesn't smack people in the head and be like, hey, watch my Christian film about Jesus. You know, it's like, no, just enjoy this experience and be better for having consumed it. Right. Yeah, I I have uh, have had lots of conversations over the years with different people about because this plagues the music industry as well, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Like, and somebody brought up one time that the the problem is that somebody's got know, a sad baby. Uh, I don't know if it's you know in, in the the value of um, being uh, positive and nice to each other there's not enough critical review of of these areas of media and so you'll have a musician that has a song or album that they put out and it's christian and it's accepted because oh that's great it's christian but it's like actually it's not great you're a really bad singer or like just like there there needs to be quality there or too. the lyrics are kind of janky <laughs> just because, yeah just because you have this positive message i guess that's better than something negative but like it doesn't mean that it's quality and with then that drags the whole industry down with it because then people are like associate well anything that's going to have you know a christian background is just going to be like lower quality i i have a whole other thought on this too because I've been following Angel Studios, as I, I'm sure a lot of people have, because they're pushing boundaries and doing some really cool things with The Chosen and all their other properties that they have. But I'm even thinking, and maybe maybe I'm being too nitpicking, but they were talking about some film, I think uh, Shift or The Shift or something. I saw some trailers about that. I'm I'm kind of unsure how I feel about them putting it out there as a faith-based film. I'm like, dude, let's let's get outside of that and just be like, here's a new film. It's really great. <laughs> here's the basic premise of it. Um, and then just by knowing the nature of the filmmakers and you know, if you read the synopsis, you'll know what the content is. It's not going to be a um, anti-faith or you know christian or whatever like uh so like that's a tricky thing too in navigating these areas where it's like well can we can we just put it forward without putting brackets around it and right. um saying no it's a it's a film and then you know the filmmaker and the things that i care about what i'm passionate about in life and so that's what's going to come through the story it's it's interesting because like they're they're put out as christian films but i actually sometimes wonder how christian they actually are because the version of christianity that's being put forth in a lot of these things isn't anything that real people really even experience a lot of times you know it's like the and this is i don't mean to sound so hypercritical but uh this is true about the music industry too where it's like positivity to the point of like um we're no longer talking about real things or looking at where all of us are like i mean a lot of these movies it's like uh the reversal of a country song you get all of the good things back at the end of the movie and that's like mm -hmm. that's that's a christian film because you know and, and it, i think it puts out like an unrealistic um idea of what faith actually is mm -hmm. because we're missing the suffering part of faith um the reliance upon you know uh of being greater than you 
uh, for these things. And like, sometimes there's not like clean endings. And actually most of the time, at least uh, like in the here and now, there's not clean endings. And so one of the things that really drew me to, you know, working within this space is to like tell those like raw and more real stories. And a lot of the work that I've done in the past has been working through churches. And so like, it's interesting because you're kind of like pushing the boundaries at church of like what's acceptable to be seen at church to a certain extent. Um, it, like, because we're wanting to like, I, at least for me, I'm like, and I think Nate would say this as well, like wanting to explore like the reality behind um, behind what people are actually feeling and not this sort of put on version of faith that we're so used to seeing, you know, um, in Christian media. And so and that's one of the things that really has drawn me to this space is like, let's let's talk about these things through a faith lens. But like you were saying, John, too, like it should just kind of come out of, you know, like it just kind of comes out of who who we are as uh, creators who happen to be people of faith, you know, so. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I wonder I don't how think, I don't think like uh, Lord of the Rings uh, novels would have gone as far if they had been advertised as a faith based story. <laughs> but, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> totally. <clears throat> well, and it's like what's interesting about Lord of the Rings, you mentioned Lord of the Rings specifically is like there's this really, really interesting metaphor that's created and it's actually expansive in the minds of the viewers. And so like, if you're coming to it with a background of faith, you see a lot of different things that match, you know, J.R.R. Tolkien's faith. But if you come to it, like there's truth in the metaphor. And so you can see lots of other things that are true about this world, even if you don't have that faith background, because it's an honest truth. You know, it's a story that is, is true in many senses. Um, and, I think that's probably the kind of work that I'm most interested in, like aspiring to um, kind of like setting up this metaphor. And uh, it, it's kind of like what uh, what Jesus did with like parables. He'd like tell these stories and then he wouldn't even like uh, he wouldn't even explain what they mean. Sometimes he just kind of like drop the mic and walk away, mm -hmm. um, which I always found kind of a really interesting thing too, uh, looking at storytelling modeled in like that kind of a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting, too to think about the filmmaker and the, you know, the story that you create and like part of it is you shouldn't have to explain it. Um, you know, certainly allegory and parable, like <laughs> there's, there's an important reason that uh, on many occasions too, Jesus would be like, all right, here's a story. And, th and they're like, what? And he's like, okay. So yeah. the person, you know, the uh, seed that falls upon the dry ground or whatever, like is like, um, and there's something to that, but it's interesting in the art because we don't always have that opportunity to explain it. Mm. So there needs to be, you know, enough of the allegory or metaphor like um, J.R.R. Token is an allegory uh, for the faith, whereas like C.S. Lewis for the Christian faith, whereas like C.S. Lewis is more of like a, a similar uh, like a simile like it's it's a story that's like one for one right aslan is jesus right. and he sacrifices himself so that their sins are removed from them okay it's very obvious in the J.R.R. token world none of it's obvious and even when you read like the Silmarillion and get the history and you're like okay so the wizards are like angels and like it's so nuts that that that's an allegory that like needs to be explained however the world has enjoyed it and consumed it and loves it. And they're getting that goodness, even if it's not all being intellectualized um, or kind of uh, taken apart in a way that would be explicit to the creator's design behind it. But there is still goodness that comes out of that. And I would love to do that. I want to do sci-fi and fantasy that mm -hmm. is just so consumable, but it's like, oh, and by the way, there's really good stuff in here that's going to like, you know, make that. your heart and, and head better. I love that. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, something you were saying too made me think about Fight Like Anna, the film that you guys released this year, the, the short documentary film um, about a young woman who was in a car accident and just kind of her journey. And that was one thing that I really appreciated was the discussion about, um, 
the subtle discussion about her faith. And there was times when I'm like, I want to hear you scream and be like, why God, you mm -hmm. know? Um, but there was definitely like just a, a depiction of, of such a strong faith. Like I want to see the, the behind the scenes uh, of this film to kind of hear some more of that story too. But why don't you guys just tell us a little bit more about the film? <clears throat> yeah. I mean, um, we, I'm just kind of going back to why we did it in the first place, I guess would be, um, it was, uh, it was fall, I believe, or winter of 20, uh, 2018. And, um, someone who, um, went, it was a college mate of Matt and mine, uh, married into the Wakefield family, a distant relative of the Wakefield family. So they were very aware of her story. And <clears throat> at that point, Matt and I were becoming a little more accomplished in our work and um, putting some stuff out there. And she reached out to me and said, hey, you and Matt should, should make a film about this. And we kind of pondered that for a little bit. And it kind of seemed like a long shot. Um, but we wanted to do a short documentary. And so I figured, you know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. So we just sent her an email, sent the whole family an email and said, hey, this is our intent. What are your thoughts? And I was pretty sure it'd be like, that's not something we're comfortable with. Thank you though. And, um, that is the complete opposite. They just open arms. They're like, yeah, absolutely. When, when can you come out here? You know, what can we do? Mm -hmm. And wow. so, uh, that was huge for us. Cause I mean, how often do you get that opportunity? And so, um, we, we didn't quite know how it was going to get paid for. Um, but we kind of had a plan in the back of our mind to do a crowdfunding for this. And, um, but we went out for the first trip to do the interviews on our own dime, the, the spring of 2019. And, um, that's when we kept all the interviews, came back home, edited them all together, created a narrative and, um, slated what kind of B-roll we were looking for. And, um, then went back, uh, we were slated to go out 2020, but then, uh, coronavirus came out and pushed us. We were able to get out there in the fall to finish up filming. And, uh, they're just, the, the family was just, they completely opened themselves up to, uh, our questions. They, they held nothing back and that is as powerful as it is. I think one of the things that was, I was most, uh, like my concerns going in kind of going back to the whole, like, this is a faith, you know, story of faith and wanting to tell it honestly, I've seen so many, there's so many ways where we, we could have told the story in a way that doesn't, that kind of um, highlights only the positives and like, cause it's like a really amazing story. It's very miraculous. Like what she has been able to accomplish in such a short mm -hmm. period of time to get back to where she was. Um, and I think the danger would have been to have told, told that story in a way that the ending high note was that and we miss out on the actual hard that this family had to go through. And I think like that's kind of the things where I've seen like other faith stories fail. They, they focus on these people's like faith in, in God to get them through, but the questioning and the difficulty having, you know, going through like forgiveness is not an easy thing. And, um, you know, coming to reality with your new reality is, is a very difficult thing. And like those questions of, you know, like, why God? I, I hope we were able to um, kind of delve into that, you know, that part as well. Um, and so I, I had a lot of, like, um, apprehension that we could get to that kind of story. But the the family was so forthcoming and honest. And it was their honesty um, that, I mean, like, it's such a gift, the honesty that they, they gave us, like, in, you know, opening up and, and telling us, the actual inner struggles that they were going through. And like, that's something that, mm -hmm. like I said, it's just such a gift and so thankful for that. And, um, and yeah, that, that was, that was huge for huge for um, being able to tell the type of story that we're interested in, in telling for sure. And let's, if you guys are cool, can I play the trailer? Sure. Yeah, you bet. Let's do that for a little context as well. I think we'll have audio. I didn't try this beforehand, so let's see. A 
A 20-year-old woman is in critical condition tonight after someone crossed the center line and crashed into her car head-on this morning. 20-year-old Anna Wakefield is in critical condition after a man crashed into her car. She was on her way to basketball off. practice when she was hit head-on along Highway 212 just west of Damascus. Well, that day was one of the most difficult of my entire life. I knew at that point that she was just fighting for her life. She will never be who she was before. I really feel like the whole thing did bring our family together. It's also just a great reminder in every relationship to love to the fullest and um, never to take any of it for granted. Love it. It's awesome. Um, it was funny too. The other day I pulled it up and I was like, oh, coming soon. Dang it. And then the next day John's like, I watched the film. I was like, wait, I thought it was coming soon. He's like, no, just scroll down. I was like, oh, I'm old apparently. So I, I was very happy that we could watch that. Yeah. Um, and I did link it in chat for those who want to go uh, Thank you. see the film to go to the website fightlikeana.com and check that out. Um, I do, before we get into all the wonderful emotional stuff as well, I do gotta get nerdy. Um, I thought it looked gorgeous and I love the treatments too of the kind of like tube TV lines on the archival footage. Like that was a real nice way to treat that archival footage so it didn't, uh, it felt cinematic. Mm. Um, and then I appreciate what you said too about you guys shot the interviews, edited, and then knew what B-roll you wanted because that B-roll is so powerful as well. Um, and it feels, I don't know, it just feels really well put together because of that, you know? Well, that um, means so a lot, I, you know, coming from you guys. I mean, that's, that's a high compliment. It, it, people who view it, the typical person who view it might not um, fully notice a lot of the intricate um purposeful things that went into it so yeah i appreciate that yeah, you know i think they'll feel that that type of thing too though sure. that's why i was having this discussion with my wife she's like i don't know that i would notice the difference between hdr and non-hdr and i'm like you might not be able to call it that but you're going to be able to feel a difference when we watch something and it's mm -hmm. okay if you know you don't necessarily think of it so you don't want it mm -hmm. however we do these extra things because they do elicit something, even if people don't understand, mm -hmm. you know, like. That's true, that's that. true. Mm -hmm. It's so great. It's it's very pronounced on this screen, but it's way more subtle over here. Um, what did you guys shoot, what'd you shoot with? Because I also, I was like, ooh, some of that drone stuff is really cinematic. Yeah. Um, I'll take the uh, geeky stuff, Matt, if you don't mind, but. Um, ooh, go for it. The drone work we used the Mavic 2 Pro, so I was, I was very happy with uh, what we were able to um, get out of that. The biggest thing we went with, the biggest reason we went with that drone, um, it was pretty new at the time, but it was very small and and compact, and you can throw it in a bag and, and go anywhere with it. Mm -hmm. um, we shot the film on the Ursa Mini, and um, the Ursa Mini Pro. It wasn't the G2. The the interviews was just the original. Uh, Ursa Mini, I believe. And oh, then nice. um, between that and shooting the B-roll, I had purchased my G2. So we shot all the B-roll with uh, my Ursa Mini G2. Um, the interviews were on an, uh, an Ingenue zoom lens, and then the, mm. the B-roll were on the Sigma Cine zooms. <clears throat> yeah, and the interviews, are the it's so crisp. Hmm. It's very nice. It's very sharp. I love that. Yeah. Really liked working with those Agenews, which, um, mm -hmm. you know, the the Ursas I've found sometimes shoot a little soft, especially depending mm -hmm. on the lens you use. And um, absolutely, there's, there's no post sharpening or anything like that. And I, you know, um, everything we're very happy considering how small the crew was, how things turned out. Yeah, that that was one thing that I thought. Just the clarity on a lot of this, I was like, I feel like I can, you know, kind of feel the Ursa on this and saw it from the behind the scenes. Maybe that's what it was. But 
yeah, just the clarity uh, mm -hmm. ended up so well. Awesome. Yeah. And what else? Like fi film treatment. There's a nice subtle film treatment too, I feel like. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, everything that we did, um, specifically post-production, it, it was it was a complete joint effort. You know, I can't really take a lot of credit for a lot. Um, I leaned heavily on Matt and we collaborated on like everything. Um, he... I, I had never really been a huge fan of using film grain, um, mm. but Matt has. He really likes it, and I think it it separate. It just kind of takes that digital edge off of it, and it keeps yeah, especially 100%. yeah. And it's it, it was applicable especially for this film because we use a lot of still images, and I feel like having that film grain just kind of keeps it alive a little bit instead of just a flat, boring, you know, image. Um, and so I, I think it was appropriate. I, you, we, we worked really hard to not do anything that's distracting and to only, you know, shoot in a way, edit in a way, color grade in a way that would show the story, tell the story without being too gaudy or, or distracting. We went back and forth so many times on how to treat photos and how to like treat video and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. It was because like we kept trying to think of like different like more creative ways or whatever to to show like the archival footage and to show the archival fo archival photos, and just kind of kept going back to like what's the it felt right for the story to just kind of present it as it is. Like we had talked about like filming photographs in like an environment and some different other different ways of like treating some of these things, but like um, I think at the end in the end presenting it as archive, I think worked pretty well. Um, but it was definitely something like, sometimes I feel like we can like over engineer, like try to be overly, at least myself, like I can try to be like mm -hmm. overly creative with something and then like maybe take it a little too far. And it's like, you know, it's the most honest if you just kind of present it the way it is. Um, mm -hmm. So we had a lot of conversations going back and forth about how to treat those pieces specifically. Well, that's an interesting point too. Like, I feel like you don't really know how far you should go until you're like, oops, that's too far. That's too much. Yeah, totally. You know, we, we reached that point many times throughout the process. So, so even, even with like the photographs that you see in the room and stuff like <clears throat> in those different places, like we were trying to think, what are the like real natural environments that something like this would, would be in like her room, for example. Um, and so like putting together the set of her room, I, I think, that ended up working out pretty well but trying to like because we were we were just kind of racking our brains like how do we show some of these things you know in a more tactile like in the world way without it feeling super like forced or anything like that mm -hmm. um, so i think it worked pretty well for that i hope it worked um but yeah. yeah and we love kind of that photo treatment too i try to do that as much as possible they're like yeah we have a bunch of photos i'm like all right print them or get us physical copies so that we can do something with it. Uh, mm -hmm. Cause as, as little as possible, I want to try to do the, the photo pan and scan, which I think mm -hmm. you guys actually did a real good job of the subtlety of it. And, and I do like that film grain that makes it not feel like a keynote presentation, you know, it feels <laughs> like an integral part of the story, which is nice. So I'm going to steal that. hundred percent. That's how you do it. Yeah. So, yeah, this is obviously a very powerful story. Um, what what has that been like for you guys? Well, I mean, honestly, I feel like Matt and I have had the best experience of um, learning from this family story. Not only have we had the opportunity of spending a couple of weeks with them during filming and kind of hearing, you know, on the evening sitting around the dinner table and just, you know, chatting. Um, but also just in post-production, you and there's some very tender emotional moments um, from multiple family members. And a lot of stuff that I've edited, I, you, you kind of become callous to that. Um, but for me, even though I've seen it a hundred times, a thousand times, it, it still, you know, kind of hit me when, when I listen to those parts. And I think that's kind of the beauty of um, how 
open and raw the family were with the interviews and how impactful that was. So I wish that everybody had the opportunity that Matt and I did to um, be on this side of it and, and to be this, you know, close to the project because I feel like we got the most out of this than anybody. Yeah, there were, when I, when I was watching it, I just kept thinking to myself, it was striking to me how um, much there were just like waves of emotion that just kind of kept coming, you know, um, which, you know, you can hit on a you know, well done documentary project, but, you know, to keep, I don't know, it was just really well done. And I don't, I don't know whether it came through, it's a combination of factors, obviously, but um, I don't know whether it was the pacing of the editing or if it was, you know, just obviously you guys handled the interviews very well too, because that, you know, to get people to uh, get to that level of comfort where they are sharing their real stories and sort of like letting their guard down, um, that can take a while to get to that point with an interview subject. Um, so, you know, you clearly did uh, an amazing job on both on both ends there. But yeah, I, I was feeling just like the waves of <laughs> emotion through the whole thing. Like, oh, this is so good. Um, yeah, I'll save my other question for another. I feel like we were really fortunate to be able to spend so much time with the family. Um, like, cause yeah, like, like we, we, and this is like, experiences like this are some of my favorite that I've, I've had the opportunity to, to, to experience where you fly out small crew, like uh, they put us up in their house. So we're just kind of like living, you know, uh, as part of the family for, for the, for the two weeks we were there, you know, we were there for one week and then the breaking came back a year later. Um, but I think, yeah, in that time, like the relationship building, like, that was such a, it was such a wonderful thing for like me as a person to be able to like get to know this family. Um, but then I think it did help the film out too, to have had the luxury of having all that, that time with them before we actually started rolling the cameras. It's funny. Cause I think a couple of times, like the first trip when we were out there, there was like this other instinct of me is like, we need to be like grabbing, like filming things all the time. Like, Cause we didn't know what yeah, the like these little conversations we're having and yeah. Yeah. And like, I, it's interesting cause I've experienced this in other shoots too, where the like being present with the people that you're with, like sometimes when you're like doing documentary work, you get, or at least for me, I get so focused on capturing these other moments that I miss the actual human interaction mm. that could be going on. Um, and I think like it's, something I've been learning is like, it's important to like put the camera down and just like hang with people, you know? And like, even if you're not, if you don't quite get the things that you think you need, like it all ends up, or at least it's all sort of ended up working out for both this project and some other ones I'm thinking of, um, where that relationship building, like it turns into something a little bit different, you know, the, the story that you're telling. And so like, and I think like, there's also the human aspect of like being present with, people in their stories, you know, before you start rolling the camera that I don't know, that's something that I definitely learned quite a bit on this. And then I think the same too, with like trying to re, you know, pick these moments of what were like the more like cinematic moments to sort of not recreate, but like kind of go back to, I think that helped too having that rapport with the family to sort of get the, and not, not really performances, but, because they're kind of just remembering the things that happened to them, you know, um, but getting into that headspace with them, I think the relational capital that was built was, was pretty huge for that. Yeah. And that's, that's an interesting thing too, which maybe with infinite time and infinite budget, it makes more sense, but it makes me think too about some of the work we've done and how fruitful it's been when we get a chance to be with somebody for some period of time, uh, before we shoot with them, you know, cause then they can get comfortable. They can let the guards down. And in, in actually some cases for the, doc, when the documentary, when we did our documentary a couple of years ago, uh, we did a lot of pre-interviews over the phone, which is kind of like, okay, let's hear your story. Let's shake out the cobwebs. Let's, let's get through all this so that when we come out, we can get to the real good stuff and, you know, 
uh, maybe in a bit more raw format. So I think there is something to that. And it's tough because would it have been really cool for you to capture some of those moments? Yeah. Could it have negatively impacted some of the other things? Probably, possibly as well. So it's kind of like a horse apiece. Uh, does the piece need this or does it need me to be attentive and engaged right now? It, it's interesting because documentary filmmaking in general is not like it's not efficient. It's not an efficient way to go about production. Um, but it's funny because a lot of uh, what we do uh, in in I don't know your percentage of your projects, you know, but a lot of what we do in our daily line, you know, our line of work is documentary style, you know, telling stories of some sort. And there's a lot of pressure to do them efficiently because it's some corporate piece and we're out there for a couple of days and you've got these handful of people to hear from and you're just trying to like fly through the process and establish a little rapport as fast as possible and then shoot B-roll on the fly as you go. Yeah, mercenary art. But, um, but in terms of, I mean, I could even tie it in, uh, make a, uh, even higher connection to like, Christianity, you know, like it's not, it's not efficient. Like the, mm. like walking with somebody is not efficient. It's not just like a, okay, I've got a five-step program for you. We're going to hammer this out in you know, several different meetings. And by the end of it, you're going to be set. And you're going to be ready to go. Sometimes it's like, this is going to be years long of like, you know, relationship building with this person and working through a lot of different things and whatever. And then in the case of document documentary filmmaking, you're like, well, when are we done? Like, I don't know. I mean, there's still obviously more story that you could have told <laughs> or that you could, you know, continue on with. Um, at some point you've got to like, you know, decide that it's ready to present to people. And yeah. Yeah. How did the writing go? Did you guys write much beforehand? Or were you just kind of open and then once you got all the interviews, then you wrote it or kind of how was that, how did that process work? Yeah, I think it was, we had a pretty good feeling of what we wanted when we went out there for the first time, as far as like the interviews were concerned and what we were kind of aiming for as a narrative. But that definitely changed once we got back and started putting together that first uh, sort of like a roll cut before we had shot any visuals. And also before we had any archival material. We hadn't really compiled any of the archival material, uh, even when we were putting together like our first a roll cut. Uh -huh. And so I think it got like a, feels like the biggest chunk of writing probably happened in that uh, in that a roll cut. I say that, but then it was like once we got so we went out and then we shot all the the b roll sequences. But then, like the last night we were there, I think we were like copying stuff off their hard drives. Like it was like we got to fly out the next morning and it's like midnight, 1, 1 a.m. in the morning and we're like copying, feverishly copying stuff off their hard drives. And he's like finding old tape of the uh, of his daughters when they were like playing basketball as like five and six year olds and all this stuff. And then when uh, like going into the editing room, uh, like Nate, when Nate showed me his first cut after he put all of those archival pieces in, it was completely a completely different film and felt so much um, so much more powerful. And that was another thing that was really interesting to me too about this that I think learning is like the archival pieces to me like kind of make the story work. And like it wouldn't what our original vision if we would have like stuck pretty closely to that, I think we would have missed quite a bit. Um, mm. But Nate did an incredible so Nate did an incredible job um, putting that cut together and like telling the story through the archives, the archival pieces that we had, like cell phone video and old VHS tapes and stuff like that. And by the time that uh, that first cut after that, like when we saw that, it was like, oh, wow, this really is this really is working. Um, and so, yeah, what's that? Oh, uh, you can finish that. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's just interesting to see like 
we had the, we also like, there was another part of it in it where we were thinking about like some of my favorite documentaries I've seen have like a really strong visual through line, like a, basically they set up like a visual metaphor for the whole story. And then, you know, like uh, that visual story is sort of like parallel to the actual like documentary story. And we had talked about some different concepts with that and none of that had felt right, you know, but you're also sort of like, to me, there's some questions about like, what is cinematic? Because like, we were thinking of these like, elaborate, um, you know, visual metaphors and visual stories we could like create as parallels and like during the writing process. And then like, when we landed on, I think this needs to be more like, represent, like representative, it felt like the right decision. But yeah, what is cinematic is an interesting question. Um, because I think it probably is whatever, whatever is appropriate for that particular project. And another interesting thing that I just wanted to, to mention was, I mean, we, we had an idea going in because we had, we didn't know their story entirely when we first went out for the interviews, um, but we checked a bunch of news coverage. I think there were three or four news stations that covered her story uh, simultaneously. We talked to as many people as we knew that knew about the story and so we kind of wrote what we thought would be good, shot the interviews, rewrote what we thought would be good, mm -hmm. and then created an A-roll cut, and then rewrote again. And then um, we got very comfortable with what we needed for B-roll, shot B-roll, changed some things up again. And it was actually, Matt, you can, you can kind of elaborate on this if you want to, but we actually had a rough cut of the entire film with all the... Um, all the archival footage, photos, and everything. We had a rough cut, um, but we had a, a slew of continuity errors because one thing that we didn't plan ahead for was when we shot the interviews, it was um, a year and a half after the accident happened, and Anna's hair was just below her ears. And one thing we... we in the interviews, right? In her interviews, yeah. Yeah. And one thing we just missed was the fact that when we went out the next time, which was bumped back six months because of COVID, her hair was literally down here and her face looked different. And so all the B-roll that we had written to be interspliced with her interview was very confusing because we had a couple of mm. um, we had a producer friend and a director writer friend preview it and give um, creative criticism for us. And we were used to it because we were so married to the project but for them it was very distracting very difficult so mm -hmm. we re 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 rewrote it and changed a lot of things around which was very hard you know it's called killing your babies you know and so we we axed some stuff we brought him some new stuff and and had to kind of re-edit and rewrite like the second half of the entire film which was a definite struggle yeah, that's and that's something too, uh, which is super unique. Is like they all look so alike, and not having familiarity with the family, sometimes I would get confused. And even in the trailer, I was like, "Oh, is that Anna?" Hmm. But then after watching the movie, I'm like, "Okay, that's the other sister." And then when there's the, I think there's another sister, right? There's a third sister. No, well, um, yeah. yeah, and they look so alike. And I and and my first thing is like, wait. Is this like an earlier thing or like, you know, it's only a hair of a second and it's just unfortunate that they all look so alike, but that was a funny experience that I had. Which one is on it? Well, yeah. it's interesting because it, it made us for the last, like once we introduced, um, once we introduced the footage of Anna that we had shot uh, the second trip out there with the feedback they were hearing, we kind of had to make the decision that we weren't going to cut back to any of her uh, A-roll anymore to to so we wouldn't be able to confuse people well that was really hard because like there's some really like strong emotive moments that she's delivering to camera that i would probably have loved to have seen oh um but that's also an interesting thing even thinking about it now because it's like what is what is better seeing the person's emotion or imagining their emotion as you like view um as you view like the b-roll of them that, that's always an interesting question that i don't know it, it's like feels difficult to figure out always what the right answer is like yeah you allow the audience to imagine 
what they're going through as they, you know, give those lines or is it more experiential and you're in the moment? I don't know. Like, um, but in this particular case, it kind of forced our hand for some of those lines that probably we would have gone to, to a roll for, but yeah, I kind of like, I think I kind of like where that happened to like push us because it did, I think for the last like third of the film, you feel a little bit more locked in because we're not coming out to the, to the A-roll pieces as much, but that was all, I think because of, you know, this problem that we had to figure out with, uh, with her own continuity. Um, so yeah, no, it, it, that was an interesting thing that, yeah, completely, we were so close to it that we totally couldn't see, you know, that problem for what it was and that needed to be fixed. That's such a good point that you bring up too about the imagination. <laughs> you know, should someone just be able to imagine it? Should we show it? Obviously, this is a very visual medium. That's a core component of it. But I think, I think you're hitting on something so just cogent. Like, what do we love about books? Something about a book yeah. is that like you can read something and you make the best version of it in your mind. Yeah. I read the same thing and I make the best version in my mind. They're drastically different. But when you're on a mo watching a movie, that's somebody else's best version of it. And we're, you know, assessing or judging. You're like, oh, is that kind of what I thought? Maybe yes, maybe no. So that's a really good point about adding in enough kind of openness to interpret visuals. Actually, I mean, and you guys did this. And I think that was really great. And I love this type of thing. I'm always telling our editors, I'm like, let me just breathe in a shot. Like, mm -hmm. give me give me the exterior and just hold on it for a second extra. Don't cut away as soon as somebody starts talking. Like, give me that, um, give me that drone shot. And it doesn't need to be two seconds. This isn't like a, a sitcom where you gotta cut so fast. Like, let me breathe in there. Let me hear this thing and I can interpret and I can imagine, you know, some part of this story. So I think you guys did a good job with that in slowing down some of those B-roll elements. So yeah, I think that's one of the ways you handle that question. Well, that's a great value of being able to tell a story that, you know, even though it's a short film, like having 40 minutes to tell the story as opposed to like, all right, it's gonna be a 90 second to three minute, you know, blurb. Like, mm -hmm. and there are some really well done. I've seen some mm -hmm. mini docs that are quite fascinating, but having enough time to like, just live in the story um, mm -hmm. and take some time for those moments. So, yeah, it's very satisfying because we're all just getting bombarded by <laughs> way too much information anyway. So just slowing down to spend some time. Yeah, yeah. That, that it was interesting because like, I, we initially envisioned this as being like a 20 minute piece or something at the at the longest that this would probably be like 20 minutes long. And then there definitely were versions of like we're watching like the 40 minute cut and it's like, we think it's working. Is it working? You know, like, but it's like hard to tell at that point because you've lost all obje objectivity, you know, because again, we thought like this was a 20 minute story. And so, but it ended up like kind of growing. Um, and that's an interesting thing too, that you're saying, John, um, where it's like, if you let it breathe, sometimes it actually feels like the, it feels shorter because you need that extra, couple of seconds or, or, or you're saying that too ryan where it's like if you add those extra couple of seconds like it actually makes it physically longer but it feels shorter to the viewer like because the pacing is just correct in that mm -hmm. way um and like a shorter cut may have actually not may have actually felt longer is kind of an interesting an interesting thing yeah it definitely felt um like a real good pace and what i mean by that is like I was doing some work last night and I was trying to watch the movie earlier in the day, but it didn't work out. So then last night I was like, all right, I got to watch it. And I was like, well, it's almost bedtime. So I looked at the time and I was like, oh man, 40 minutes at the time it was long, but then I, you know, I'm two minutes in and I'm like, I love it. Right. Hmm. Cause the pacing, the timing, um, it was, it was well done. And I didn't feel like 40 minutes or, you know, didn't feel like 20 minutes. It felt like I was just going on a journey. I was having this interactive, uh, emotional adventure. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what I love in my media. Thank, yeah, thank you. Good work, guys. <laughs> <laughs>
That's awesome. Yeah. That, that stuff too, in like in the world of then trying to connect it, you know, to a commercial market or you know having to create a product, uh, you know, because everybody in the corporate world is asking like, well, what's the ideal length for this, you know, thing? And mm -hmm. there's rules of thumb, but they don't have anything to do with the story themselves. They really have to do with like the psychology of a consumer when they're skimming through something and then they look quickly at the, the the amount of you know time this thing will take to watch and then make a decision it really doesn't have anything to do with like this is another like thought that i've been formulating that i haven't you know put together yet into uh an argument for business but um it's not that people's attention spans like are short. I, I, they are, but that's not the reason for the length. Like you can get at a short attention span to watch a longer story that's well done. They're not gonna click on it in their, you know, at the end of their lunch break when they're just trying to like skim through something and they're like, well, I gotta get back to work in five minutes. Um, you know, but they, they might watch it later when they're ready to like sit down and watch something. Um, so yeah, there's just a lot of like different nuance there with like, what is the right length of something? Um, some of the, the TV shows that have been going on recently are so amazing. Like, you know, I don't want them to end after I, countless hours of, storytelling you know this art this story arc is you know days and weeks long um and then sometimes you know you're watching a three minute video and you can't wait for it to be over <laughs> you're just like so yeah it's that's interesting because like you think about like i'm thinking of certain like netflix shows because we don't we aren't uh confined to the 60 minute block or mm -hmm. minor commercials anymore it's like if the episode needs to be an hour and 15 minutes long, it can be. If the episode really only needs to be, I mean, I've seen like some, some episodes of what are normally like hour long television, it's like 37 minutes long or something like that. And you're like, that just gets short changed. No, I think they just like, that was the right, you know, size for that. And it is interesting, like, can, can advertising change in that way? I don't know. Like, that'd be kind of interesting. Like, do we have to be like, so like, focused in and obviously with television in the past with 30 second spots and things like that you had to be but i wonder like no um they're coming for you they are <laughs> if uh those same rules apply i mean some of the things i like about watching um the work that that the two of you you make is that you let things breathe in a lot of like your your documentary work and like really get to kind of know the characters that you're dealing with i was just watching the one about the the guy who won the Addy that you did recently. Um, do, you, do you know what I'm talking about? Like the, he like won a silver Addy, I think. Is is it George or there's- um, Harvey, Andy. Ford, he did like the Ford truck ads. Harvey. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed that piece because you, you guys let it like breathe for a little bit lo like longer and like you could really get to know the characters. And um, yeah, I really enjoyed that. That piece of shit did. So yeah, but uh, yeah. I, I think there's something about I, I will often tell our clients this like if you're interrupting somebody from whatever they were doing and trying to put something in their face to tell them about your product, the length of that thing I have this much mm -hmm. attention span for you. Mm -hmm. Like okay, I'm putting up with it. Like you better entertain me very quickly or just give me the most basic facts to tell me that there's a sale on this thing and it used to be this much and now it's this much. And if I was looking for that, maybe you've got me. But any longer than that, like I was doing something else and and you like, you know, interrupted what that was. Um, but if you are, and again, this is a, this is a story for story's sake, but but if you're telling a story, even if it is related to something, you know, a marketing effort, uh, branding effort or whatever, um, and you allow the viewer 
to decide that they want to engage in this story. Well, now, and then if you're going to tell a good story, now I have a long period of time for you. You know, like, um, there's a lot of YouTube channels. I see the trend on YouTube going along, you know, because mm. they see that, like, yeah, if you do it well, like, people want the content. Um, so I have a lot of stuff that I'm, like, halfway through and I've just paused. I'm like, well, I'll come back to it later. I can't watch it all right now, but I'm like, save this for later. It's kind of like consuming it almost like I'm consuming a book or an article or something where it's like, okay, is I'll YouTube, is that like, like TikTok, but bigger? Yeah. Yeah. There, yeah. It, there's, uh, there's less young women and more clothing. But. <laughs> I think I, we got to get you on TikTok, John, so you can. It's not exactly about. what you need to not do. <laughs> be good for the world. Yeah. Um, so we are kind of winding down here. Before we play our ending game, uh, we're just kind of getting into this content. But kind of one of one of the big questions I have is like, what was I don't know your most your most favorite memory from this whole uh, filmmaking experience, or you know, what sticks out in your mind as like this. This was just awesome. I think for me, um, I'm going to be sneaky and kind of hit two things into one. Uh, the biggest thing was was the camaraderie that we were able to uh, have, the, the relationship we were able to develop with the family. And um, it was really cool to not only tell their story, but feel like we are a part of their story now um, in a very you know, small way, um, being able to feel like we're very close friends after it. And, you know, you do so many business deals where you have a business relationship with a client and it's good. That's, that's awesome. Uh, this is just on a whole new level. Like it, it was just instant when, when we first arrived, you know, first got picked up at the airport in uh, Portland, it was just, we were just good friends already. And, being able to build the relationship with them that way and then take part in their story instead of just, Hey, here's a, you know, a mirror of their story. We're just going to, you know, just bounce it off of us. And we felt like their story went through us and then came out of us um, in, in a way not to be too cheesy, but um, I just really enjoyed the, the ability we had to become close friends with them and be able to, to, take their their openness their vulnerability and display it in a way that they are happy with which was a, a terrifying thing the first time they watched it um but i yeah that, that was kind of the, the coolest thing to me you know you do a lot of projects and a lot of it feels kind of businessy you know you, you get the shots you do the edit you deliver the deliverables um but this was much more of a a personal thing for both matt and myself and you know, it felt like we we're going on vacation, even though they were, you know, 12 to 18 hour days. Uh, it was, it was still a lot of fun. And I think That's like, awesome. yeah, the come, you, you talked about the camaraderie bit. I mean, I love, I love when you can make a crew as small as possible and you can go to, you know, like traveling, traveling crews of like three or four people. It's, it's a tough thing to do. Um, but when you can figure something like that out and still get like really, really great results like there's nothing more fun than i don't know like nate and i were working on a piece recently where we like yeah we're we're just hanging out before sunrise waiting for the sun to come up so we can film this uh you know this 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 landscape or whatever and it's just like those kinds of moments where you're you're both like it's work but you're enjoying it and you're like this is this is so cool that i get to to do this i mean like we were like driving around the countryside getting plates one day for like uh, like the drone work, some of the drone shots and stuff like that. And it's like, it does, like it's it's a lot of like long hours, but it feels like vacation. And especially when you get to like, the people that you work with are, it's such an important piece. Like, I mean, being able to enjoy like working with each other and like, that's one of the things that's been so awesome about um, Nate is like one of my best friends and being able to, uh, you know, for us to be able to hang out while, you know, making work is, I don't know, it's, 
it's pretty fun. Um, and and then if I can add a second one too, uh, yeah, to I'll echo, allow it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the experience with the family, and like that's the other part is like getting to know people that you would never like. Film brings you together with these people that you would never probably you know know otherwise in your life, and those relationships and like yeah, those are those are hard things to beat. Yeah. One other question I'm very curious about, uh, it's a little different angle. Do you prefer documentary or uh, narrative filmmaking? Ooh, right. yeah, love it. Wow. <clears throat> you want to start, Nate? Yeah, sure. I mean, that's, that's really tough because, you know, I love them both. Um, we would never be able Cheater. to do something. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> the safest political answer. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> no, my biggest, my biggest, uh, you know, challenge is that I, I care too much. <laughs> <laughs> I work too hard. <laughs> um, I think, boy, John, that's a tough one. I'm going to make you answer this afterwards. Totally. Uh, but it's, you know, you would never be able to do something like Fight Like On It if it was just a narrative piece. I feel like we kind of did a job of uh, making it kind of narrative. It's a document. It's a narrative documentary in a sense. Um, there is something about planning out shots with talent and directing them and getting the shot and taking it over and over and over again. There's some. There's something beautiful about that. Of, of do it until it's the way you imagine it, and then you know the final product is is your true baby. But with documentary filmmaking, there's just so many other things that are. Um, so intriguing to me, you know, the, the rawness of things and how we have this game plan going in and then it's, you know, flipped upside down because of some events that we didn't know about or the answers that we received. And so it's kind of like casting a big fishing net out, but you're only allowed to use whatever fish you bring in. Um, so it's so much different. And if I had to pick one, uh, I'd probably have to take a little more time to to make that decision because that's tough. I, I love them both. I but there, there's just special places in my heart for for both of them. I love. What I if love I give you? Both. What if I give you a countdown? What if I say you got to pick in three, ah. two, one? <laughs> I'd have go. to do documentary. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. I'd have to. I think the number one thing that would make me make that choice is just uh, it's truth as reality. Um, telling honest story was fantastic because going into it, we had all these cinematic and and uh, really cool abstract ideas to bring to the table and none of it was appropriate for for telling her story so there's something powerful about being able to um tell a story you're kind of taking part in into that you know we're, we're kind of walking alongside the wakefield family during their trial um spreading the word there's something special about that i i think for me uh there's like that which is most satisfying to create and that which is most uh enjoyable experientially probably like i like nate like nate was saying like there's something to like here's the thesis of what i think this film is supposed to be and this shot's going to lead into this shot into this shot into this shot and we're going to film all these things together and see if our thesis was right and like when it works like that's pretty, that's a pretty great feeling where it's like the thing that I had in my head, I can now see on screen. Like that's like, that's probably the most like artistically satisfying to me is like when those kinds of things work, but like the discovery process of documentary and the people like being able to meet people that you wouldn't get to meet and spend time with people and like the relationship building that happens. And like, it, it is the, the right and left turns that are tossed at you are pretty fun to try to like navigate. Like I think for, if we're talking like just the experience, I think probably documentary film is, is like the most fun in that, in that regard. Um, something that I, one thing that I've tried and been really interested in trying to figure out is like how to kind of blur the lines a little bit between the two of them. Mm. Um, in both ways, like where, uh, you know, I saw this great short a couple of years ago. Do you guys watch uh, Solomon Lighthelm's work at all? I don't recognize the name. I, he used to work for, he used to be one of the directors at Variable, but he had this, uh, 
he had this one piece where it was like definitely like a narrative story that he was telling, but the characters that he cast, the people that he cast for the roles um, were, had gone through those like narrative experiences. They had, they had done like, that was the life that they had lived through. So he was casting people rather than actors, almost like what they did with like nomad land. So like this kind of like blurring the lines between the two of them, I think is a really interesting space that I'm kind of curious about exploring a little bit more. Yeah, John, what's uh, what's your answer on that? I, I think it's documentary for the the reasons of that the discovery, um, because well, yeah, I, it, it is a hard thing because it's like, well, you know, the, I suppose you can find it. Uh, there's not a lot of documentary that I've seen that's like. Um, very humorous, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of comedy and stuff. Um, and so I get to like play in that world more when we're doing, you know, narrative scripted work. Um, there are some good ones. Ryan, did you put me onto that one about the, the magician? Um, oh, I, I did recommend it, but somebody at the office might have recommended oh it to me. Uh, what's it called? The amazing, Charlie recommended it. The Amazing Jonathan. Yeah. The Amazing okay. Jonathan. If you haven't seen that, yeah, you, you want to see it. Actually, that was probably a Charlie recommendation. Yeah. Talking about a uh, discovery process, that one is amazing in a discovery process where like you think you're making one documentary the documentary starts breaking the fourth wall because basically the filmmakers just like kind of inserts himself into it. Like this is insane. I cannot figure out what's going on. I thought I was mm -hmm. making this. I don't know if I'm getting conned. Mm -hmm. Now there's other, like there's other film crews showing up also making documentaries at, at the same time about the guy that he thought he was being hired. It's amazing. Um, it's on Hulu. There's uh, Matthew to your point that there's a, a series that was on Netflix. Is it just called Mars? Um, mm, where yeah. they where they have there's narrative, and they keep cross cutting to like interviews with like <laughs> celebrities and whatever. So it's like there's interviews that are like documentary, but they're like cross cut with the narrative of the show. As though, as though they were like referring to what was going on, you know. Did you say it's on Netflix? It's it was National Geographic. Where okay. who has it though? Because it was somewhere for free. It had been on Netflix. I don't know if it is um, anymore. Uh, yeah. So oh, and then the other one that is not documentary, but for some reason it just made me think of it is. Uh, Broad church and specifically because of the what I had read about the way that they would go into a lot of scenes where he would the director would not let the actors see the house that they were going into mm -hmm. before the scene or something. Um, he would put a extreme importance on like first takes. Most of what is in the show ended up being first takes hmm. because he was so interested in getting the genuine reactions from people. And maybe that gets to part of the answer that I'm giving about documentary because what we're chasing when we do a narrative is truth. Hmm. So, like, it's the narratives are more satisfying to us and better when the performances and the scenes and everything are more like truth uh, mm -hmm. or, or just feel more like, you know, legitimate connection with people. So maybe I just haven't had the, the benefit to, you know, in the Midwest, we don't, and in the pro, the level of production that we do, we're not working always with like super experienced A-list actors, you know, on all of our, corporate pieces and stuff so maybe i'm just maybe i would it's, I would, it's hard yeah <laughs> like yeah. if we had more connection to that but the tough question yeah. 
Uh, so I'm going to jump in too, but real quick, I want to I want to prep you guys. So let's do this real quick. This is lie. <laughs> so we're going to play a game called True, Two Truths and a Lie. So you guys got to come up with three stories, and That's I will tell truth. my answer to this while you guys come up with this. I'll give you a minute to come up with stuff. But you come up with two stories that are true, one story that's not true, and you tell it to us and we got to guess what what the answer is. Um, and if you're playing along at home, we'll send you some uh, coasters to celebrate happy hour with us. Also, real quick, Aaron Williams was asking, Nate, when was the last time you put a paper suit, uh, put on a paper suit to film something? I'm, I'm sure there's... Uh, <laughs> There's a very valid reason you put on a paper suit. A paper suit. What exactly? Do you know is Aaron it? Williams? Aaron Williams. Uh, he he's a guy from Janesville. We've done a lot of short stuff with him and creative stuff. Interesting. I assume so, you knew him. I'm probably so. I did just do a shoot for Mercy Health in Janesville. Uh, with dry water production, Stephen Pickering, dry, dry water production, and I put on a big old bunny suit and and beautiful hairnet and mask and everything like that, shooting in an OR. I'm wondering, and that's probably what they're referring to. I've never heard it called a paper suit, so I was, I was thrown off there for a little bit. But that's that's probably what we're talking about. It was. Yeah, I, I'm assuming it's just made of toilet paper. That's that's what it, I was assuming. It, it was sexy. <laughs> Aaron, if you're there, give us more context. Um, okay. <laughs> So you guys think about your three stories, and I'll tell my answer to this question. So my answer, um, given like a choice of like, hey, what do you want to do next week? It would be documentary. Mm -hmm. I I think it's also low lower stress because you don't have to have a perfect idea, and everyone's okay with it being fluid and changing. Um, the one kind of caveat. So my 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 answer would be documentary. I do really love narrative. It's just way more stressful to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I love what you can do with it and how you can craft it and how you can put it out there. But there is something to the fact that it sometimes doesn't turn out exactly how you want it to for various reasons. And when you're selling that to someone, that's really hard. Mm. You know, like with a documentary, you're like, okay, well, let's, uh, I don't know, we'll change this. So we'll take this out. Or we'll add that back in. But when you have a 30 second commercial and everything is timed so specifically, you're like, well, the actor didn't deliver it well. And we all went through the interviews and we were all in the shoot and we tried to do our best and we didn't get it. And so it's just going to be what it is. So I feel like with narratives, you end up um, uh, just accepting some uh, less good things than in an air or in a documentary where you're like, oh, we'll just switch it out and we'll change it. You know, you, you have more flexibility and, and yeah. less maybe pressure or stress. Narrative ends up being more like documentary than you would think it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like you end up having to just work with whatever it was that you actually got. Yeah. And people don't realize that, you know, they're like, no, it's got to be perfect. And you're like, well, it's going to be what it is. And we're going to do the best and it's going to be awesome. Um, also, my wife brought these down. I don't know if you guys know, I think today is National Donut Day. Oh, so oh, are you kidding me? Are we missing National Donut Day? I'll send you I'll send you a photo so we can post it. This is according right. to my uh, what about looking at over here. I'll show you. I, know you want I do this Wonder Dad thing. <laughs> and so they give us fun fun things to do and today they said it was national donut day it's the national day calendar do you, oh, wow. do you have donut on there he's right it's donut day wow. it's also jersey friday and i'm not making this up it's love your red hair day huh. there we go That's john okay. we can do it so hey how's my donut you? ryan that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I got it. No one came to my home office, though. That that was why I like didn't get on until 11:50 because I had to like stop and get the donuts on my way back from dropping something off. If I'd have known you had donuts. I would have come over. Man, this is a huge, huge miss. <laughs> I almost <laughs> just it. dropped some off here, actually, at the office. <laughs> John, we need to have a party later. Yes. All right, so you guys ready for two truths and a lie? 
Think John so. and I won't play. It'll just be you guys. Oh boy, Nate, you better go first. Okay. Um. So I guess I'll I'll, I'll relate it towards uh, Fight Like Honor, the documentary, uh, a little behind the scenes. Um. So three stories. One. We hired a drone operator to uh, shoot some of our drone work in downtown Portland. And it, it fell out of the sky and landed into the river in Portland. That's number one. Uh, number two, we accidentally deleted a card from a half day of shooting. Hmm. And number three, we missed a flight because Matt had to get his morning coffee at McDonald's. Oh man, if it was anywhere but McDonald's, I'd, I'd be like, oh, maybe, maybe it was worth it. But come on. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, McDonald's is one of the places that my wife will allow herself to get coffee from when we travel. She's very particular. It's like, it's got to be a nice coffee shop or McDonald's. It can't be a gas station. <laughs> I don't get it. I actually do follow. I follow that. <laughs> like for, for what they do, McDonald's does. This is not endorsement for McDonald's coffee. But yeah. They do, they do perfectly adequate compared to other. That's what she says. Yeah. Matt, Matt is selling my, my stories here. Yeah. So we got, you hired a drone operator and it fell out of the sky and landed in the river. Accidentally deleted a card from a half day of shooting. Missed a flight because Matt had to get his morning coffee at McDonald's. These are really good. You told really good stories because of the specifics. There's Thank enough you. specifics in them. I'm, I'm a good um, liar. We'll see. Now, you probably didn't fool Matt. Like That would have been the challenge would be to fool Matt because you can easily fool us. Mm. Let's see. So, John, what do you think? I'm, I'm going to go with the drone one because I feel like when he was talking about drone before, we might have we might have heard about that. There might have been a slip up of sharing a little bit more detail about that drone story. Uh, they used a nice drone. They wouldn't have wanted to lose one of those. Um, we've done it. We've all done it. We've all put it in the water. But uh, <laughs> the card... Oh man, cards are easy to delete, and that's that's a tough part of filmmaking. So that's pretty believable. I mean, they're all really believable. I also don't know what Matt's uh, coffee situation and problem is like. Um, so I'm really left in the dark there. But I'm going to go with the drone. You're going to go with drone. Yeah, it's tough. Um, I, I think too any of these could have happened on a different project because part of the story was that you said this happened on fight like Anna. So I'm going to say, I'm going to say you didn't actually delete a card because I feel like you might've told us that as well. Maybe that was a different project. That's my guess. Um, let's see, Matt, do you know the answer? I do. I'm, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit offended that you think <laughs> I would, uh, value mcdonald's coffee for that for that level i mean if it was like uh if it was uh pilcro coffee in milwaukee <laughs> then maybe this would be true but no it probably hurts more because it, it could totally have been <laughs> but with the insert different thing than mcdonald's coffee. But to answer your question john yeah matt is what i like to call a coffee brat <laughs> But that is so you, you just stuck it to him with the McDonald's here. Yeah, I threw him under the bus. I'm sorry, buddy. Be nice Love to it. me. Yeah. That's awesome. So we, we, yeah, so did we you definitely miss a did. Flight? We did not miss a flight. No. Okay. That was a fabrication. That we we did crash a drone into the lake, which did sucked. you have a floaty or anything on it? No, no. Um, it sucked more, less about the the money it cost to replace it, and more all the footage that we. Weren't Absolutely. Able to, to get back, yep. um, and then I think it was to to make up for it is why Matt and I drove around Oregon shooting plates. We just 
Drive around. <laughs> this looks great. Hop out, sticks, shoot it, jump back in. We did that for like a half day, last minute, right before our flights uh, on, on a Friday. And um, we had some shooting in the afternoon. And in, in the hustle, I don't know why, I never format a card on set unless an AC says strike it. And uh, I formatted a card and, and we lost all that. So it's just the B-roll, oh, the, my the cutaway footage that was just never meant to be. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So if you if you see a lot of drone footage used in uh, in the film, that's that's why we we lost everything else. Man, I feel your pain. That's awesome yeah. stories, though. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Matt, you're up. Uh, when I was a child, I went to NASA space camp and almost met John Glenn, but that didn't happen. I, when I, uh, I want, I once dressed up Sounds like a lie. I once dressed up <laughs> in, a uniform, in a civil war uniform and marched around, uh, Stoughton, Wisconsin with like the old, like musket and stuff. Uh, and I, uh, really bad at this game <laughs> uh and let me think of one more and true I once, story and i and I, I once <laughs> i once almost uh made a feature film in the country of kyrgyzstan who who who's a what what's what country uh the country once almost made a feature film in the country of kyrgyzstan curious down Kyr Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan. Okay. Kyrgyzstan. Clearly not something I'm familiar with. All right. So we got, as a child, you went to NASA camp and almost met John Glenn, dressed up in a Civil War uniform and marched around Stoughton. That sounds very much like what you guys were talking about uh, for your first films or your first stuff you made. Almost made a future film or a feature film in the country of Kyrgyzstan. I got an email. We got an email, and I've been emailing this guy back and forth. It sounds ridiculous, but he keeps replying, so it's fun. He's like, <laughs> "I'm I'm an acc acclaimed filmmaker. Here's my IMDb page, and I need you know I need a production company to help me out. Blah blah blah. Here's more details." <clears throat> and then when I followed up with a question, he sent me this whole huge long email, and was like, "Yeah, it'll be three days, nine hours a week, three k a day." I'm like. You don't, it sounds like you don't understand how math works. This all sounds made up. So I sent a nice email back. I'm like, hey, this sounds really nutso. So I don't know if you're fishing or what this email is, but I'm just curious, like, what the, what the game is here. Um, he hasn't gotten back to me, but that's, that makes me, <laughs> the Kyrgyzstan, uh, like, yes, we're going to hire you for this film. It's in a country. You cannot find on the map and you do not know where it is, <laughs> but it's, it's real. And we will pay, you will only work nine hours a week, three hours a day, and we'll pay you $3,000 a day. <laughs> like, I'm in, let's do it. Yeah, we're losing money if we don't do this. <laughs> <laughs> Too easy. Uh, right. So Aaron says last one. <clears throat> what do you got, John? Oh, she's outside. She's got something. Ooh, she's got a surprise. <laughs> Not donuts. Mm. She probably also doesn't know that it's a day to celebrate my red hair. <laughs> right, right. Um, okay, let's see. I'm going to go with the... You were so smooth on the delivery of the second one. And then the delay on the third one, you know, would make you think that one. But I looked up Kyrgyzstan, and it's a place. And, <laughs> you know, you're involved in in probably, like, mission work and stuff. So maybe that, maybe that would be – I've had a few different people I've known over the years who have been involved in mission work and churches and have set out to make films in those places. Um I'm going to go with the Civil War because although it's believable, 
it's also just off of the idea of World War II or one or whatever it was. You guys, it wasn't Civil War that you talked about. So that's the one I'm going with. Ooh. Civil Good. War I'm going to go with Aaron's Turkestan one. Kirk Kyrgyzstan, because he does an elbow cough, and he was right the last time. I don't have a good reason. Those are those could be all very good lies. Let's see. So, Nate, do you know? I do. Should I say it? Yes. <laughs> okay. And then Matt can give We're us the stories. In. We're locked in. The the lie is space camp. Space camp. Oh. Space camp. I say this as a compliment, but I believe that you would go to space camp. Thank you. <laughs> I always wanted to I always wanted to go to space camp, but it never worked out in the cards. I would I would also have loved to have gone to space camp. Uh, it's an un unfulfilled, unfulfilled dream. There you go. They all, um, seem, they all seem obvious in hindsight. <laughs> right. I uh yeah. Civil War one, definitely true. I like bought all the gear, thought I wanted to be a reenactor because I, when I was a little kid, my mom, like, this probably goes into the whole writing stories thing, made me like a costume because I was obsessed with the Civil War for some reason, really specific, um, and would go around fighting battles in my head. Uh, that one's real. Only lasted one time, though. I couldn't, I couldn't do all the marching all day. That was too much, <laughs> much like real work. Um, and then... Hopefully it'll happen at some point in the future, but um, Nate and I almost did a low budget feature in Kyrgyzstan earlier this year. We'll see. Possibly nice. state. We'll see. We'll see. Is it narrative or documentary? It would or be narrative if we, okay. uh, if we can figure it out. So, but uh, that fell through for a few different reasons, but yeah. mainly COVID. Mo mainly COVID. <laughs> yeah. Not well, Ryan that turned fishing. into something. Not if Ryan's fishing lead doesn't bring us to Kyrgyzstan totally. first. Totally. <laughs> was it was a was a specific country mentioned, Ryan? No, he said he he's an American filmmaker, and I looked him up, and his email and everything that he sent is looks legit. But I'm like, this could be a really well put together, like catfishing or fishing. Uh, yeah. I don't think he's yeah. catfishing me, but like fishing <laughs> yeah. scheme. So fun. I'm just like. This is ridiculous. Like, tell me more. <laughs> uh, cool. So thank you guys so much for jumping on. Um, we might we might just need like a, you know, part two documentary filmmaking. Uh, even though we talk for like an hour and a half, I feel like these conversations are never long enough. But uh, that's why I appreciate you guys. And I appreciate you coming on. Is there anything that we can plug for you? Um, yeah, anything we can plug for you. I think we've got, I can throw up the, this, there we go. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'd love, love for people to see, go out and see the film, or go out, I wish it was out. Go home and watch the film on your television. I would love, that would, <laughs> that'd be great. It's a, it's a really um, inspiring story. I think. So. Yeah, John and I second that. It was definitely a great watch and it's a fast 40 minutes or something. Sit down, grab a snack. It'll be great. I, I also love, too, that it takes you to a place emotionally that hopefully you don't have to go to in your real life. You know, that's why I love crazy movies, uh, because I don't want to deal with that in real life, but I love dealing with it in stories. Um, yeah. Anything else? What else? You want to plug anything? I, I didn't get the time to look up. Uh, do, you guys probably have a website, right? You guys have your own websites. I know that. Yeah. 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 So... Um, the Fight Like Anna documentary kind of gave birth to uh, Shadow Hope Films, and that's kind of the uh, the name that we're going to go under at, at doing more work like this going forward. Uh, the site is under construction, so can't really plug the site just yet. Do you got a little diggy man? I, uh, <laughs> not that cool. Yeah, <laughs> Those are good days. Awesome. Well, we also do a podcast. This will be a podcast uh, maybe in six months or so. Uh, you can check that out. Let's Backflip.com, Let's Backflip Show, or wherever your podcasts are sold. Apple, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, Zipline, uh, 
Tinseltown, uh, Stream Deck, Cup. I don't know. Um, we're in all the things. Amazon. Check it out there. And that's what we got. John, you got anything else for me? Just, uh, just stay off of TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, uh, you got to say it properly, John. <laughs> stay off the TikToks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You'll go blind. I thought there was going to be some sort of slang term that I was supposed to know. Nope, guys, and enjoy your your, your National Donut Day. And Thank you so much for celebrate coming. red hair. Get yourself <laughs> a donut. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. celebrate red, red hair. Celebrate red hair. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, guys, so much for Thank coming on. We'll see you next time. Yep. Good talking. Bye. Bye.